So I've gone back to hybrid consume for just a little bit. Uh, I've definitely warmed up to armor hence out, which I'll explain in another video. But I am uh, actually started my ranked ladder climbing a bit, which I don't like to do, but I kind of I feel like I sometimes have to just kind of save face or whatever. Um, so I'm back to hybrid consume. It's probably my favorite deck in the meta right now, and I also think it's one of the strongest. It's I think it's right up there next to armor hence out, maybe a little bit little bit under it maybe um but i really enjoy the flexibility and you know kind of variety of play that i can get out of dagon consume as opposed to armor hence out which are which follows a very strict kind of you know game plan and archetype and all that good stuff uh so i'm going up uh, against crack and crate uh a buffing uh just a general buffing deck it's it's really not too difficult to deal with, especially since I've played this deck quite a lot. Uh, I actually had to drop it because it was actually so frustrating to play because people had so many counters to it. But it's not strictly a bad deck. It's just it has a lot of counters. So I, uh, I believe I went first and I used my spy just to flip the coin. I have enough tempo on my side to be able to pass uh, even with this. I, I'm... Uh, I have enough tempo to be able to pass the strength that I gave with the spy with one of my cards. Uh, so though I, it's only an upside to play the spy right now. Granted, this does make him, give him a longer round, but I'm not th that uh, concerned about it. And I play my fog immediately so I can start making that spy a lot less uh, worth a whole lot less. And generally speaking, you don't want to put a, a weather on something like this range row because obviously this guy just going to soak up that damage quite easily. Yeah, he's just trying to make this round as long as possible. Avalak is a good, uh, good pick in that deck. <clears throat> I believe I go for yeah Behemoth because I'm saying okay, you want to go for a long round, I'll go for a long round. And Behemoth basically says that exactly that. Now something to keep in mind: Behemoth is a little bit tricky to play since it requires at least two turns to set up uh, just to get worth out of it. So you don't always want to. So if you're playing Arrakis Be Behemoth, you want to make sure you are committed to going for a long round and able to go for a long round uh, and not just kind of like play it just to set up a combo because you could possibly get passed on without actually getting worth out of it, which is always a... Well, excuse me, a little bit yawny here. Which is always a consideration because, and like, you know, you still run into things like Coral, which can just, you know, artifact compression in it, since it's such a high value card. I think on average, my Arachnus Behemoths get something like uh, four to six, uh, maybe like four to seven hatchlings, and f just four of them is like 12, and it comes out at nine, that's almost like, what, uh, 21 or something like that. So it's pretty good. Arachnus Behemoth is really, really good in certain situations. And there's not really a point to uh, put it into the deck. You can just pull it out with Monster's Nest. Especially since uh, you don't always have a good engine going, a good consume engine. But whenever you do have it and you do have Monster's Nest, Monster's Nest in your hand, it can be uh, some pretty huge value. And of course, if you don't necessarily need the Behemoth, you can always go for Drowner. So Monster Monster Nest is a really cool card, which makes it so you don't necessarily need to tech in things like Drowner or... Uh, Behemoth, or you in things like Ghoul or Foglets or anything like that. Even though I'll probably never use it for a Foglet or a uh, the Fog creature that gains plus one, but it's still there. The option's still there. It's a very flexible card. I, love, I like Monster's Nest. It's probably one of my favorite silvers in the game. Next to like Ox or something like that, even though Ox doesn't really see much use these days. So it looks like this is a pretty good Igni opportunity right here. I forget if I actually do that. I think looking at it. Oh, that's right. No, no, no. He goes over to his turn. He's going to mess it up. That's right. I remember this. Okay, so <laughs> I recorded this last night. So he uh, he pulls out his his, uh, his dude, weakens it, making sure to stagger his unit so it doesn't get hit by... Ah, excuse me once again. And he gets hit by Igni. Uh, I know he's going to pull it out immediately, but that's fine. I want him to play that Sigtrief uh, as soon as possible. I want him to play all of his high value cards now so I can take advantage of it later. Basically, like a big strategy of this deck, like one of its primary win conditions is trying to bleed out as many cards as possible in round one and two while still at least winning one of those rounds. 
And then going into round three was something like one Necker and maybe like two consumes, like a Brand Warrior and a Ekimara. And then you just pull out all your Neckers all at once. So by him pulling out Sigdrifa and using and pulling out the, uh, the 21 straight dude, I can safely pass here. I'm down 40 points. Because I played the Spy, I was able to flip the coin and allow myself to only go one card or to be one card up going into round two, but still lose around. And I have carryover, so if he, he can't just drive pass unless he wants... Um, Or rather, he, he can't drive past unless he doesn't want me to... <laughs> let's keep using statement. He needs to play one card, at least, so he can get to me to play at least one card. But since I have all this carryover in my hand, it doesn't matter. I, I, we can go, like, four cards in, and I'd still be fine. Although he probably doesn't want to do that. He probably wants a, a long round going into round three. Although, maybe he wants, like, the control of round two to try and win to round me. Which isn't a bad idea. And then he go he can like force uh I forget what he does exactly, but in his position uh, you could possibly yeah you can go all in on this round, and then you can save like one revive for round three to pull out one of those huge uh, long swords. So I go immediately for the consume on that great sword to make sure he can't revive it again, and also it's a huge tempo boost for my dude. Oh, I almost forgot. The whole point of this video, by the way, is going to be at the end. So if you want to check that out to go to there. The theme being bigger is not always better. And I'm sure if you've played uh, up against this deck, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm just trying to set up some more get my carryover. It's totally fine to play a Necker here. If I only had one Necker in my hand, I'd probably still play it. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. And uh, I don't really have much of an opportunity to use weather here because if I just played on the range row, um, it's kind of surprising he's playing first light. You don't really need first light in this deck and the deck he's playing anyway because you can just set up your long swords to soak up that damage. But anyway, so basically I, uh, my my weather, my five strength, uh, whatever that dude's called. I don't know why I'm blanking that guy's name. I use him in every deck. Uh, I, I'm pretty safe to use him because I'm not really going to get much what, uh, worth out of weather. I might as well play it and get the tempo out. Or I can play Dora Gray or Ekimara to try and set up a little bit more carryover. Playing one of those is totally fine. And since Ekimara is a little bit more straightforward and it's a little bit less tempo, I can play it now as opposed to later. Dora Gray is still a flexible card that can possibly uh, be used for the Raptor. So I want to keep that in my pocket just in case I need it. Also, I just realized this. I always use Ekimara to hit like the lowest unit. But maybe I should be going for the higher unit. Because as soon as he hit this, uh, this was at 7 strength. So as soon as he hit this with 3, this doesn't regress back to 6 strength. So it's still it's stuck at 4 strength. But if I had eaten the 18 strength... This would have been boosted up to uh, 24, and then you would hit it to 21, and then it would regress back to 6 strength. So I lost 2 strength by consuming the lowest unit. That's interesting. I actually never thought about that. That's actually a mistake by me, then, by always trying to consume the lowest unit. I don't necessarily need to consume the highest unit because it's kind of dangerous, but I should probably be hitting units that have at least like 5 strength or something like that. Kind of a mistake. Okay, Woodland Spirit, that's what he's called. Yeah, so I'm pretty safe to play Woodland Spirit because I'm not going to get much worth off of this fog. In fact, it's almost a detriment. So I go ahead and play my second Dora Gray, set up some more carryover, get the neck route, because I realize that my uh, I need a little bit more tempo here. I need to be able to pass him in one card, which I actually don't, which is kind of a mistake. Ah, that's all right. Because I have a game plan, man. I have a game plan. I know how I'm going to win this game. He actually might have been able to two-round me if he kept if he kept going. No, he actually wouldn't have. But it, he would have been better off, I think, if he tried to two-round me. Maybe. I wonder what his last two cards were. I guess I'll get to find out. Okay. <clears throat> so, Caretaker here. I always call him Gravekeeper, I think. Oddly enough, so I don't need the uh, I don't need this Van Warrior because I already have two Neckers gone and I only have this last one in my hand. Although it won't really matter. Drop Van Warrior, Mirror Go Test Storm, not that great. 
this is bigger is not always better. I know I'm going to caretaker and, and luckily I'm going first so I can do it immediately. Keep in mind he's already used Sigdrifa and he has virtually no other way to pull silver cards. So instead of playing Jang, uh, instead of pulling Jang Fret, which is 21 strength, I'm going to pull a long sword, which is 19 strength. It's less strength, but he does have a way to revive the long, the great sword with his uh, priestess of Freya. I know he has a way to revive this. So if I take away from him, there's no way he can, as opposed to Jang Fret, which is a larger strength total, which is generally where your eye kind of like, you know, uh, focuses on, but you you need to realize that he has no way of reviving that, so it's a dead card in his graveyard. And even if this was like something like 15 strength, I would still take it away from him. Or even let's say this is just 13 strength. Like let's let's you know widen the gap as much as possible. If this was 13 strength, I'd probably still I would probably still steal this away from him. Because it's not it's not just I'm gaining 13 strength. I'm also taking away 13 strength from him. It's almost as if it's like a, t a 26 strength play. If it was at 13 strength, because I'm I'm giving it to myself and I'm taking it away. That's why I didn't go for Jank Fred. And if, uh, as you can see, he notices I hover over. I'm like, wait, no, I need to take this. He's already used Sigdrifa. If he had not used Sigdrifa, I would have taken Jank Fred, although it wouldn't have mattered that much by that point. But knowing he used uh, Sigdrifa, I'm fully safe to take that card. And seeing as how I took away his win condition, he just concedes. Good stuff. So using uh, earlier parts of the game to your advantage in later rounds and using knowledge of the cards to know what his game plan is going to be. Granted, I know I'm pretty cognizant of what he was going to do since I played that deck. It was a little bit easier. But in general, you can be you can spot these things if you just kind of look closely enough and play different things and get different experiences in the game.